Back when my football days at North Texas, you know when the most fun time was at practice? It was obviously at the end of practice, but there was a reason. Uh, it was when the coach, he, he, would, he would do this. And that meant he would go, he'd blow it and he'd say, everybody up, everybody up. That meant the quarterbacks who were throwing, the receivers who were catching, the linemen who were working on picking up stunts, firing out defensive backs that are doing their thing. He'd blow that whistle. Everybody up. Because now you quit being your distinctive position and everybody was together. Now we were the mighty three and eight North Texas Eagles. All right. Or my senior year, one in 10, whichever you want right there. But. And so that was my favorite time. That's what the book of Ecclesiastes, I'm sorry, we're not in Ecclesiastes, the book of Revelation. That's what the book of Revelation is. Everybody up. Every book of the New Testament has a particular flavor and a particular angle. Romans differs from 1 Corinthians, it differs from 2 Corinthians, differs from Ephesians, Galatians, all the way to Jude. The four Gospels are different because they're writing to a particular group and their particular digression and departure from the truth. They're needing to be impacted in a particular aspect of the truth. That's not Revelation. Revelation is calling everybody together. Everybody up. We're all together on this. As a matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, there really is just a smattering of material of God revealing to John what John wrote down about the thoughts he was having. You see it in chapter 1, chapter 22. The rest of the time is a vision. John is seeing something that hasn't happened. And he is seeing it in symbols that are going to be fleshed out in reality. It's like time travel, it's out of body. It's some place that nobody has been. And John is going to see it. That's why the book of Revelation, the word revelation, apocalypto, apocalypse. Calypto means the covers. Apo means back. The covers are pulled back. This is, you, you could call it apocalypse now. You're going to have the covers pulled back and you're going to see the future now. And he's going to do it within 22 chapters. And everybody's going to be together. No distinctiveness. No particular country, no particular uh, race, no particular uh, place you're from. At the end of the chapter 2 and 3 on the seven churches that represent all of us, he will say, he that has ears to hear, let him see what he says to the churches. This is all of us, the churches. Well, in chapter 1 of Revelation, in verse 1, 2, and 3, he's going to begin with the book's divine authority, why this book is to be listened to. And in the first verse, it's the book's origin. It's declension from God to you. The revelation of, not meaning about, but through, the revelation that Jesus Christ makes, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. He sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John. Here's the way it goes. God gave to Jesus. Jesus always carries out the Father's will. I can do nothing of myself. As the Father speaks, I do. As I see, I do. There's a unity in the Trinity. The Father dictates. The Son carries it out. And it comes uh, by His angel to John the Apostle to be given to His bondservants. The Father, the Son, the angel, John, the bondservants. And in verse 3, blessed is, what's the pronoun? He, down to the individual. God, Christ, angel, John, bondservants, you. And so that's the origin of the book. Its fountain is found in heaven, the truth of God. It's inspired. Its claim is in verse 2. John testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus, even to all that he saw. He calls the testimony of Jesus the word of God. That's its claim. And in verse 3, this book expresses 
the unique ability of the Bible. Psalm 1, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the path of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law, he meditates day and night, be like a tree planted, yields its fruit, doesn't wither. And whatever he does, he prospers. There's a blessing upon the word of God. Often in the Proverbs, first 10 chapters, my son, Solomon will say, regard this more than, than gold and silver because of its ability to guide you in life. Uh, Jesus talking about whoever hears my word and acts on him. A man builds his house on the rock. A man who doesn't builds it on the sand. The Bible has the unique ability to bless when Israel goes into the promised land. Joshua, this book of the law will not depart from your heart. You'll meditate on it day and night. Then you'll make your way prosperous. Then you'll have success if you do what is written in it. And so this verse says, blessed is he who reads, those who hear the words of the prophecy. I'm sorry, who hear and who heed the things that are written in it for the time is near. The, the book of Revelation gives its unique blessing to the reader who is affected by it. Uh, it's interesting. This is the one book it tells you to read. This is the one book we don't. Because the blessing is... When you read the book of Revelation, you know where you are in history. You know what God is doing. You know what God is going to do. You saw in verse 1, it soon must take place. That's the Greek word that we get the word tachometer. It means quickly. It means that there is nothing standing between this book and the rapture of the church and the subsequent tribulation period. There's nothing standing there. God needs to fulfill nothing. This is an age of grace of his gathering in the elect. And it will quickly take place like birth pangs upon a woman with child, like a thief in the night, it shall come. The end of verse three, the time is near. The last thing on God's historic calendar is to save out the elect in a world that has renounced him that is called the church and then to catch them away and then to begin the tribulation period. And so the blessing that comes from verse three is that the Christian is meant to know where he is, who he is and what he is supposed to be doing. The Christian doesn't drift in life. He doesn't react to life merely. It's not that we wake up and lay there and think, what should I do? I better get up. Why? I got to go to work. Why do I go to work? Because I need money. Why do I need money? Because I need bread. Because I'm hungry. And so we just react to biological urges. That's despairing. No, the Christian knows who he is and why God has left him here. And that's to proclaim the name of Christ and to model him, obey him, and to enjoy him. And so there is the book's origin claim and its unique blessing. Now in verse 4, John. John is the last of the apostles. This book is written in 90 plus AD. The temple in Jerusalem has fallen in 70. It's been 20 plus years. The temple is gone. Judaism has, in a sense, a true Old Testament Judaism has now passed away into the greater substance and the sun of the church. The shadows are gone. And so John is the last apostle. He's the last credible author. When he writes it, the bow is put on the Bible and all the dangling ends of the Bible are brought together. God's revelation of himself, his finishing of his word, fulfillment of prophecy, his purposes with Israel, purposes with the church, purposes with Satan and the angels, his judgment of the world, all these dangling ends at the end of the New Testament, they're brought together in the book of Revelation. Thus, nobody can bike up to your house. Let me, let me say that again. Nobody can come out of the woods and say, I now have book 67. Nobody can say that. The last author has come and gone, and there is no salvific, moral, or historic or prophetic need for anything. It's finished. We look past the, the church age to the tribulation, to the second coming, the judgment, the kingdom, final rebellion, new heavens, new earth, they'll reign forever. KHVN signs off. And that's all. No one can come up with any more Bible. John, the last apostle. It's interesting. James and John asked Jesus, remember they sick mama on him? 
and said, we want to sit at your right hand. Jesus said, can you drink my cup? Yeah, we can drink your cup. You'll drink it. You'll drink it. James was the first apostle to die in John chapter 12. I'm sorry, Acts 12. James was. His brother John is the last to die. In the book, after the book of Revelation, it's funny how God has different plans for different men, different women. And so, in verse 4, John to the seven churches. The word seven is used 54 times in this book. And there's a reason. Uh, how many days does it take to make creation? Six. The seventh day is to worship what God has done. The number of the creation and the number of man is six. That's man. Man is not meant to stand alone. It is six plus one. And that is the number of completeness of God and man. Man is alien from God. But someday his will will be done on earth even as it is done in heaven. And there will be the convergence of God ruling his creation in the kingdom of God. In the church, man is reconciled back to God. We have begun that kingdom even now. And so there will be a seven. And that number will occur 54 times. Everything is going to come together. Uh, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. That's Western Turkey. And we're going to look at those seven churches in chapter 2 and 3. And each one of them has a very clear message on what Jesus loves and what he hates, and what he expects. They are little sound bites that are prisms of pure light. They're the most effective teaching tool of ecclesiology in all the Bible. You can't argue with them. I'm going to tell you something interesting about them. The first of them is called Ephesus. It's the church that has its truth right, but begins to wander from the first love, just like the first century church began to do by the end of the first century. They had their apostolic doctrine down, but they began to wander. And then the next church is called Smyrna. Smyrna means death. Because after the apostolic church, you have 10 Roman emperors that put the church to death. And that's the church that suffers. Smyrna. Matter of fact, Jesus says you're going to suffer for 10 days. And then you have the first church that starts compromising called Pergamum. You start allowing worldly ideas. That's what happened in the early Middle Ages. After Constantine and the church became accepted and now people didn't have to bear a cross to come in. Now it was there to their social, political, monetary advantage to be Christians after Constantine. And then you got Thyatira, the church that doesn't just tolerate. They embrace Jezebel. False teaching. That's the church of the Middle Ages. And then you get Sardis. It's a word that means to escape. And that's the church that it said, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Compromise, corruption. Now we got a cadaver, a dead church. And now the good guys are those escaping. That's called the Reformation. And then you've got Philadelphia, brotherly love, phileo delphos. And that's the church that I give you the keys of the kingdom because you have a little power and you've kept my word and that's the church of the 17th, 18th centuries, 19th centuries that saw the outgoing of Protestantism and the gospel message to the entire world. And then you've got Laodicea, Laoti, Laoti Dike. It means the people run things. And that's the church. Where's Christ? Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door. Christ is trying to get in his church, trying to get in. Because this is a church that is rich and doesn't need anything. And that's the modern church. So these seven churches are in a book of prophecy because they are a sketch of church history. Isn't that something? Incidentally, we're in Laodicea. There ain't no eighth church. This is it. Verse 4 the seven churches that are in Asia. That is where John worked around Ephesus is where he worked. And he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos right off the Turkish coast. Uh, that is where John died. So this is nearby where John was. By this time in 90, the gospel message has moved from Jerusalem. It has gone to Antioch. 
And now the center of its activity is Western uh, Asia, Turkey. Well, in verse 4, grace to you and peace. And it's not just going to be from the Apostle Paul. No, this is grace to you and peace from the Trinity. The Trinity is mentioned in verse 4 and in verse 5. It's always grace and peace. If you ask a man if you're going to heaven and he says yes, you say why? Because I've lived such a good life and I've tried to do my best and I hold to a standard. What his gospel is, is peace and grace. I have worked to be at peace with God and now he shall award me grace. The gospel isn't peace and grace, right? Because if it is, it's going to be peace, no grace. Because nobody's good enough. It is grace. And now we're at peace with God through Christ. And so grace to you and peace. And here is the Father from him who is and was and who is to come. Present, past, and future. God had a plan from eternity. He was. God is enacting it and saving out a people. But he's not finished. He will come and he will finish his plan. The Bible says that the fool puts his hand in the dish and doesn't bring it to his mouth. He doesn't finish what he starts. Not God. He was, he is, he is to come. Grace was granted you and I from eternity in Christ. All the Father gives me will come to me and I will not cast him out. I will raise him on the last day and I will come back past, present, and future. And so the father says, I am a God who does not change. Incidentally, that's what his name, Yahweh. Put the vowels in there, Yahoah, Jehovah. That's what the name Yahweh means. It's a combination of the Hebrew words, was, is, shall be. Yahoah. And it means that God is never a God that learns new things. He always knows. He never gets strong. He's always omnipotent. He doesn't forget anything. He doesn't grow. He doesn't expand. He is infinitely perfect, immutably, always. And that's why no one else gets that name, Yahweh. It's the perfect name for a true deity. And so I was, I am, and I am coming in verse 4, and from the seven spirits that are before his throne. Most of you, that word spirits is in capital. It's not put there in the Greek, but the English translator puts it there. Does it speak about angels that are called spirits? Or does it speak of, we're going to mention the Father, and the next verse is going to mention the Son. Is the Spirit here the mentioning of the Holy Spirit, grouped among the two other members of the Trinity? I think it is. And the reason it says the seven spirits that are before the throne they're going to be pictured, these seven spirits throughout the book, as flames of fire that bring light and burning and consumption, just like the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you why it's believed that John speaks of the sevenfold spirit of God. If you'll keep your finger there and go back to Isaiah 11. In Isaiah 11... In verse 1, it speaks about the coming of the Messiah. There were three individuals in the Old Testament that are anointed by the Holy Spirit to do a work. A prophet, a priest, and a king. Well, here is the ultimate prophet, priest, and king, the Messiah. And it says in 11 verse 1, then a shoot. Well, I'll tell you what, if you want to go on up two verses into chapter 10, verse 33... It says, the Lord God of hosts will lop off the bowels with a terrible crash. Those who are tall in stature will be cut down, for he will cut down the thickets. Have you ever cut a tree down and you got the stump left? What comes out of the stump? It's not a new tree. Doesn't something come out? It's called shoots. Little shoots come up, like little branches out of it. Well, when Israel and the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judea, when they are cut down, God's not going to be finished with them. A shoot is going to come forth. In verse 1, a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, meaning a Davidic king, and a branch 
from his roots. The word branch is the Hebrew word Nesser. And that's where it's believed that we get a city called Nazareth. And Nesser means a shoot. That out of this cut down nation of Israel, in the time of the Romans, when they're underfoot, there's going to be a branch. Life is going to come from this dead nation. And he's going to go in Nazareth. He's going to be of no comely appearance that we should worship him. He's going to be a little fellow, child of Mary and Joseph, the carpenter's son. But in verse 2, incidentally, if you want to name a kid, a great name, Branch is a good name. Y'all ever heard of a guy named Branch Ricky? He was the owner of the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers, well, general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, who after World War II said it's wrong for a black man to go die overseas, but he can't play ball in his own country. And he got a guy named Jackie Robinson, and he pioneered that work. And you know why he did that? Because he was a Christian. His parents were Wesleyan Methodist from Ohio, and they named him after Jesus Christ. They named him Branch Ricky. So don't name your kid Branch unless he's really a stud because it's an embarrassment to have a little rotten branch right there. That's when you say, maybe I ought to cut a branch off and just wear you out. And in verse 2, this branch is going to bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord, number one, will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom, that's two. Understanding, that's three. Counsel, that's four. Strength, verse five. Knowledge, that's six. The fear of the Lord, that's seven. The sevenfold Spirit of God whose job is to empower and then to glorify the Son of God, both in His ministry and His illumination in the Word of God and His reproduction in life in the heart of a believer. And so, grace to you and peace from the immutable God and the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, all-present Holy Ghost who is among us. And in verse 5, and here's the son from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. He is our prophet. He tells us exactly who God is. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. I and the Father are one. He is the image of the invisible God. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten God in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. The words that thou gavest me, I have given to them, and they have kept them. And so he is our prophet. We don't have to worry about not knowing what we need to know in life. We know it through Jesus Christ, the, who became to us wisdom from God. He is our prophet and he is the firstborn from the dead. Of all those that will rise from the dead and go to glory, whoever the first one is, probably some guy from Lubbock, it'll be a Texan, all right, that will come up first. He's really number two. Who was raised first? Christ. You know what's interesting between Jesus and us? You and I were raised because of a Savior. Jesus had no Savior. Jesus was judged by his work. And his work was the perfection of God. And death could not hold him in its power. And so he is the first that is up from the grave. That's the origin of the church. Is an empty tomb where a dead man rose. So he is our priest who offers his life as our mediation before God. He's our prophet, he's our priest, and he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He is our king now, and someday he shall be king of all. Now what's interesting, those three roles in Israel, the prophet, the priest, and the king, nobody could hold all three of those jobs. The prophets rose up from uh, Samuel, then Elijah, the priest came from Aaron. The king came from David, from Judea. Why can't you have one person with all three roles to be the philosopher, the priest to, in religion to bring you to God, and the king in politics to rule you? Those are the three most important aspects of civilization. Truth, religion, and rule. Philosophy, religion, politics, prophet, priest, king. Why can't you let one guy be the final teacher, the final mediator, and the final ruler? Absolute power does what? 
corrupts absolutely. You can't trust one man to have those things. It's running 100 watts through a 40 watt bulb. He'll pop, he can't handle them. Only one guy gets to be prophet, priest, and king. And that is the word of God, the lamb of God, and the lion of Judah. Isn't that amazing? I don't need to study philosophy unless it's to study how people have messed it up. I need to read my Bible. I don't need to worry about working myself to God. I need to embrace my priest. I don't need to worry about what is right and wrong in life and letting society dictate it. I have my king and he has told me. So it's the perfect system. A guy named Luke Ferry once wrote a book called A History of Modern Thought. And he said the ultimate ideal thought is it is evangelical Christianity. An infinite personal God who is Trinity that reveals himself, shows man the truth, dies for him, will return and rule. He said it's the perfect system. And then he wrote, if only I could believe it. And it is. It's the perfect system. And so, grace to you and peace from the unchangeable Father, the omnipotent Holy Spirit, and from Christ our all in all. Now, to him who loves us, that's in the present tense. He loves us right now. He loves us. And here's how we know it because of three things that he did. He released us from our sins by his blood. The blood of Christ that was shed for my sin enabled the justice of God to reach down to me and declare me righteous and God not compromise who he was. Paul put it like this. He delivered us from the domain of darkness and he transferred us into the kingdom of God's dear son. And so he released me from all of the penalty of my sin. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but in whole, has been nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. It is well. It is well with my soul. And so he has released me from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and someday even the presence of sin. The Apostle Paul said, in this earthly tent, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Y'all ever look at yourself in the mirror and groan? Oh, I'm dying. I'll tell you something I've learned through the years. You can look at yourself in a mirror, but never look at a picture of yourself. See, in a mirror, you know the poses you can strike. Right? I mean, be honest. Y'all have certain mirrors you avoid in your house. See, because you look at them and you go, is that all me? Right there. But there's some mirrors you kind of look good. But if you look at a picture of yourself, that's objective. I have what's called a cell phone. Not a smartphone, I got a cell phone. And one of the girls on our staff last week said, do you know you have a camera on this thing? I said, the heck you say. I've just figured out this voice mail stuff, all right? She said, there's a camera. I said, I didn't know that. She said, here, smile. I said, that took a picture of me? She said, it did. Let me see. And I went, Jesus. <laughs> I thought I looked like Don Johnson. That was Lyndon Johnson. I was looking at him. Like <laughs> Are y'all with me? Never look at a picture of yourself. I told my wife, I said, my face looks like a spiral ham. <laughs> like a big spiral ham. All right. What am I talking about? Yeah. He released us from our sin. The penalty of sin I don't bear. The power of sin is broken in the very presence of sin. Someday it's going to be the great getting up morning. And we're going to have a new tent. Perfect. He loves us. And in verse 6, he made us to be a kingdom. He has put a new covenant in our hearts whereby we obey him. 
He has affected obedience in us by the rebirth. We are now the children of God and we are his kingdom. We now have a free will that we never had. We never had a will that was free to obey God and seek God and want God because we didn't desire him. You don't choose what you don't want. God has opened our heart to where now I can desire the things of God and I can make choices I never got to make before. We're not absolutely free, but we have a freed will that we never had. And so he has made us his kingdom. Remember a guy in the Old Testament named Daniel working under the Babylonians? They said, we want to give you a new name, Belshazzar. I'll take your name. We'll give you a new job working for the king. I'll take your job. We want you to learn Babylonian. I can learn the language. We want you to, uh, what was the other deal? I want to teach you the literature. Do I have to? Yeah, okay. I have to. And we want you to eat the food that's sacrificed to idols, like the king, his choice food. I want you to bow down to this idol. Remember what Daniel said? Nope. I'll take your name, take your job, take your language, take your education. That I will not do. Because Daniel, past tense, had made up his mind. He would not defile himself with the king's choice food. A Christian has bright lines. I will not go there. Because we're under the kingdom of God. Amen? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you're going to be provincial leaders of our country. Great, we'll be the best you got. Incidentally, we need you to bow down to an image. That we cannot do. Then I will toss you in the fire. Then you will have to toss me in the fire. And if our God wants to, he can deliver us. And he can, and he will. But even if he don't, we're still not going to bow down to your image. Well, I'll heat the thing up seven times. We'll heat it up. Because I'm not going to be alone down there. And he threw him in. So he says, even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down. Mordecai, you will bow down to Haman. No, I won't. Then we'll kill all the Jews. I hate to see that, but I'm still not going to bow down. There are certain things that I will not do. I read in the paper this morning about a girl that was on the, uh, the uh, American, I believe it was the Olympic soccer team. And she's not on it anymore. Because the soccer team had to wear a gay pride t-shirt. She said, that I cannot do. I got rules from my king. And he tells me, no, I may be in the world, but I'm not of it. And my king says, I can't do this. You remember back a few years ago when the, uh, they made that ruling at the Supreme Court that the guy was wrong, the woman was wrong for not being a florist for a gay wedding? Remember that? It was a landmark decision. It's been appealed. And uh, down in Dallas, T.D. Jakes made an interesting statement to his congregation. He simply said, the world's got their rules, we got ours. If they want to decree that, that's okay. He said there's only one supreme court, and that is God. And so we'll do what we can and be the best of citizens, pay our taxes. We'll keep the speed laws at times. Uh, <laughs> when it's convenient, we'll do all we can. But are there some things we will not do? And we know what those are, and we will not do them. Why? Because I'm an American secondarily. I am a Christian, primarily. Someday this country will die and I will die, but my king and I will live on. And so we make that hard call. We're his kingdom today. And the world can look at us and say, so that's what the people of God look like. Yeah. That's them. We want to be seeker aware, but we're not that seeker sensitive. They're lost. They need to be like us and our king, not us like them. I go where they go. I speak where they can understand it, but I'm who I am. And I'm not going to change that. Neither are you, neither are we. And in verse six, he's not only made us a kingdom, his people but he's made us priest to his God. What's a priest? It's the man in the middle. 
And he teaches men about God and brings men to God. He represents God to men and men to God. The words of a priest should preserve knowledge. Men should seek instruction from his lips. He's the mediator of the Lord of hosts, Malachi. It means that if you want to know who God is, I'll tell you. What would you like to know? Would you like to know about how he made things? Would you like to know about law? How about the Savior? Would you like to know that? How about marriage? Song of Solomon. You ever read that? Would you like to know about wisdom? We got a book called Proverbs. We got Psalms about worship. We got little epistles, little letters that'll tell you every way you're supposed to live. And we can tell people that. Isn't that right? We're priests. And we also bring men to God. A priest offered sacrifice. We bring men to the cross. And then we say, are you washed in the blood? Yes, I am. Welcome into heaven. And so, incidentally, in the book of Exodus, chapter 19, verse 6, God says to Moses, uh, I have made Israel a kingdom of priests. Now, did Israel have a distinct tribe that was a priesthood? Yes, Levi, the Aaronic line. But in that sense, the whole nation is a priesthood. It's called the Holy Land, the beautiful land. And so, Israel got to be the one nation that if you wanted to know God, they said, come here. Come here. I'll show you who he is. They dropped the ball. And now God gave it to somebody else. Jesus said, the kingdom is taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit. John quoted Exodus 19.6 right here. Paul quoted it in Titus 2. Peter quoted it in 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, that's important that Peter, Paul, and John would take that verse and apply it to the church. We get to be the people that represent God to a dying world. And we give men the chance to stand before a holy God. When I was in seminary, y'all familiar with Dr. Anthony Evans? Yeah, y'all liked him so much. All right. Uh, when I was in seminary, Tony was speaking one day. And this was in the day when the Dallas Cowboys had a quarterback named Danny White. And they had a receiver named Tony Hill. And they had a running back named Tony Dorsett. And so, a lot of you have no clue what I'm talking about. And that's why your life is struggling. Okay. <laughs> but Tony was speaking to the seminary. And he says, let me tell you what the church looks like. He says, Danny White drops back to pass. Uh, Tony Hill runs down the sideline on a fly route. He's going to throw it. And he's going to drop it in the end zone for a touchdown. But just before he gets ready to throw, here comes a satanic blitz. God took Israel and handed them his word, handed them his priesthood. But here came Calvary. And they got to the quarterback. And they killed him. But just before Danny White goes down, he looks off to the side. And there's Tony Dorsett. And he flips the ball out to Dorsett. The satanic linebacker hits Danny White and down he goes. But Tony Dorsett has got it. And now he is going to do through niftiness, all right, what Tony Hill would have done through speed. And he looks at the church and he says, Christ is the quarterback. Israel is Tony Hill. Satan is the linebacker. You are Tony Dorsett. Isn't that good? It ain't that good, but, it, but it's real good. <laughs> you and I get to be a kingdom of priests. Wow. Well, in verse 6, to him, this kingdom is never going to end. Never going to end. The glory and the dominion forever. Our king will not sin and be judged by another nation. We will reign forever. That's how God has loved us. That he has died for us, released us, made us his people, and put us to work. There's an old African curse that says, may you be idle forever. 
Isn't that terrible? That was when I got saved. That was why I got saved. You know that? I didn't know you got heaven out of the deal. I was just tired of reacting in life and responding to biological urges with no ultimate purpose. Y'all remember the, the 60s doing your own thing? I was tired of my own thing. It was because everybody else was doing my thing. We were all just puppets. When I found out you could be saved and have purpose in life to communicate what no human could or even knew about the most vital thing in the life, salvation, reconciliation to God, and the most important thing in the universe, and that's a human soul. I said, I can die for that. I can fail at doing that. That's the greatest thing in the world. And then I found out you got to go to heaven on top of it. And so he has made us a kingdom. We're his people, but I'm going to put you to work. If I'd have been God, I'd said, I'm going to save you. Now, don't tell anybody who you are. God says, I'm going to put you to work. In verse 7, this king is coming. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. That's from Daniel chapter 7. They asked Jesus who he was. He said, I am, he said, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? He said, I am, and you'll see me coming in the clouds of glory. He's quoting that verse, Daniel 7. And they said, that is blasphemy. What need have we of witnesses? That man must die. John takes that verse and says, that's who he is. Are y'all noticing that our boy John won't back up one inch on inerrancy, the Trinity, the atonement, the deity of Christ, the sovereignty of God, salvation by faith? John won't yield an inch. That's why he's on an island. Verse 7 He's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Jesus said, when I come, you're not going to have to go say, hey, he's in the desert or he's in, this, in the closet. He's in this room. He said, as the lightning flashes from the east to the west, every eye will see me. Don't try to think what that'll be like. We have no paradigm. The closest we have is the rising of the sun. That everything now is showered with it. And that's the way he's going to be. Even those who pierced him. Who pierced him? Israel. Israel was now sent into exile. You know what John is saying? When he returns, they'll be here. That sounded ridiculous until it happened. We now have an Israel. And the tribes of the earth will mourn. You know why they'll mourn? Because when he comes, it's too late. He does not come for grace. The ax is laid at the root of the tree. And those that do not bear fruit are cut down. And now lost men are irrevocably in that place. Saved men that during the tribulation are looking forward to him. Their redemption now draweth nigh. But the, the nations will mourn. That's interesting. If you ask a guy today what is the worst thing that could happen to him, it would be to be regarded as a believer in the Bible. When you ask him in that day, what is the worst thing that ever happened to you? Not to be a believer in the Bible. If only I had another chance. The door is closed, like on the ark. When Christ comes, the door is closed. In verse 7, so it is to be. What's your last word in verse 7? Amen is an Aramaic word, and it means I believe this. We believe in the Trinity. And the word of God that shows us last things. We believe in a Christ who died and a mighty Holy Spirit and a God who is all powerful and immutable and does not change. We believe in a God that would free us from our sin, give us a new nature, make us his creation, make us his priest. And we believe in a God who not only died, but he's, see verse six, he died. Or verse five, verse seven, he's coming back. Y'all believe this? He's coming back. Christ rose into the clouds. The disciples were looking. An angel spoke up and said, gentlemen, what are you staring at? Get to work. This same Jesus you saw depart from you is coming the same way as he left. Get ready. He's coming. Jesus said, I'm coming. Why? Because in verse 8, God does not change. I am the Alpha. I started this thing as creator. And I am the Omega. I am the final letter. 
of an alphabet that communicates truth. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, Genesis and Revelation, and I'm coming. He is the Omega Man, says the Lord God. In the Old Testament, that would be pronounced uh, Yahweh Elohim, who is, who was, and who is to come, that he is Yahweh, the unchangeable, and he is the Almighty. In Hebrew, that would be El Shaddai. Shad is the Hebrew word for the mountain. And he is the God of the mountain who does not change. And that is why we look forward to him. You know, this that I'm teaching to you, we're going to look at the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation and the return of Christ. And we're going to interpret it literally. In the first century, that was the way that eschatology was interpreted. The church knew they were being punished and they were dying and they were by the hordes. They had no notions that they were the finality of God's kingdom, nor that they were going to set up the final kingdom. They were just trying to stay alive. And so they were premillennial. They were pessimistic about man. They were optimistic about God. And they were looking for the coming. That was the early church. One of their signals and signs was the Alpha and the Omega. He's coming. Uh, once we got into Constantine and following, and now the church had the upper hand, now we got to start persecuting people. And so from about the fourth century on, the church is now, thanks to Constantine, Theodosius, and those guys, no longer do you become a Christian to get killed, you become a Christian so you can stay alive. What happens when you start lowering the standard? You get corruption. And that ended up in the early Middle Ages. And you know what they did now? They got very optimistic. They thought the church was the kingdom of God, and they got into what was called replacement theology. They didn't study the Old Testament, didn't care about Israel. We were now Israel. Your Old Testament was thrown away. Uh, they didn't do real well. Matter of fact, we had to have a Reformation. And the Reformation, now the Protestants took over, and they had a gospel of grace. And they also had a lot of other wonderful things in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, the, the great centuries of Protestantism. They took the gospel, and not just the gospel, but Western civilization to Africa and India and China and all kind of places. Uh, and so we got to thinking now that the church was going to establish the perfect utopia, and at the end of which Christ would come. So early on, we were pre-mill. We held to the coming of Christ literally. We interpreted it literally. Then we got to be amill that there was no kingdom, literal. We were the kingdom. And you interpreted Revelation allegorically in the church. And then the Protestants, they felt, well, the, the guys from the 19th century before, uh, they felt the church was going to establish utopia. Uh, they felt that the leader in that had a manifest destiny. It was a country called the United States. And so it became post-millennial. He'll come after the church establishes a perfect society. That belief, the pilgrims held to it. Puritans held to it. Uh, it had a little problem in the 20th century. We had what was called World War I and World War II, which is really World War I-B, where you had Christian nations, Germany, Italy, America, France, England, even Russia and Russian Orthodoxy. And we were killing each other to a rate that had never occurred in the history of man. And then we found a way to harness the atom. Now we can kill you from a distance and we can evaporate you. Uh, and so out of the 20th century, we weren't optimistic anymore. Man is not going to establish his kingdom. We are not the finality. And then there was an event that took place that all of a sudden... The eschatological view went from post-mill and amill back to pre-mill. That Christ will return before a literal second coming. And we interpreted the book of Revelation literally. Can you guess what the event was? I'll give you a hint. If you're going to take Revelation as literally, 
The word church isn't mentioned in Revelation 6 through 19. Israel is centermost. So if you're going to take Revelation literally, what are you going to need? Israel. Can you guess what event took place that flipped everything to pre mill? 1948. We in this church take a literal view. If I'm going to take the first coming of Christ as literal, I can't allegorize the second one. And so we take it literal. It's the simplest way, the easiest way. And it's the most affable way to my soul because if the Puritans couldn't do it, me and Joel ain't going to pull it off, you know, <laughs> in establishing the kingdom. My king is going to have to come. And I don't think his kingdom is just going to be in symbolic terms. I think he's going to make it time and space. So we are pre-millennial. Plus, I paid good money to be pre-millennial. I attended Dallas Theological Seminary. I thought of a hymn we could sing after this. Kendall won't let me. He won't. He said, you know, he said that the, the tune's all right, but the words are bad. It goes, bad boy, bad boy, what you going to do? What you going to do when he comes for you, bad boy? The disciples used to sing that around the campfire. Bad boy, bad boy, what's it going to do? I got a great hymn. You ever heard the hymn, uh, Hiding in Thee? If you haven't, you'll love it. Pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you for eight verses of the eschaton, beginning this book from the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to be read by those who have known his kingdom and have known his new life and known his, his new office that they have been given, who look forward confidently to their prophet, priest, and king who has established philosophy, religion, and politics, this kingpin, this cotter pin of all history. How wonderful, how full of wonder to be a Christian. How awful to live in the notion of peace and grace. How marvelous to be extended grace and peace. And so, Lord, bless us as we depart and as we study this in these weeks to come. In Jesus' name, amen. We got a good hymn right here. Uh, do you remember whenever Moses said, I want to see your face? And God said, you can't, no man can look at me at live. What I will do is I'll place you in the rock and I'll cover you with my hand and I'll pass by and you'll see my back. And that's the safest place you can be is in the cleft of the rock covered by the hand of God. We get to look at him in the Old Testament as he passed. In the New Testament, we behold his face and that is the face of Jesus where the glories of God are resident. Nate, give me something. Y'all know this? Oh, safe to the rock that is higher than I, my soul in its conflicts with sorrow would fly. So sinful, so sinful, Blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. Hiding in thee, hiding in thee. Thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. Do I need to go up? Are we okay? Let's go up.
That was written by Ira Sankey, the, the musician and song leader of Dwight L. Moody. Could we have a hand for Mr. Sankey right there? <laughs> Father in heaven, we are so thankful for what we sing in this tune. Thou blessed rock of eternity, I am hiding in the cleft that is rent for me. Thou blessed rock of ages, we hide in thee. Through Christ our Lord we pray, amen.